For those who don't know me, my name is Evi and I'm a stage 3 ICM and anesthetics trainee. So today's presentation is going to be acute, uh, about acute upper gastrointestinal bleed. Hopefully, um, after we finish the presentation, we're going to have a little bit of an idea regarding uh, the causes of upper GI bleed, diagnosis, um, risk stratification tools, management, pre-endoscopy and after endoscopy. And we're going to talk a little bit at the end about balloon tamponade and um, the tips procedure that we use in uh, virus seal bleed that they're refractory to um, endoscopy. Starting with the upper GI bleed, so um, the total incidence is 134 cases per 100,000 population per year. In general, as we can see from the pie chart on the right side, the most common cause is peptic ulcer disease that accounts for 30% um, of upper GI bleed. Largely, we can split it into variceal and non variceal bleed. Other causes of non variceal bleed include malarivized tears, erosions, esophagitis, while vascular lesions and malignancies are like really, really, um, they don't account for much, about 5% in total. Variceal bleed is about 10 to 20%. In general, upper GI bleed has a very good mortality, so it's about like 10%. And there are a lot of audits that they show that we don't really manage it very, very well. And this is why the British Society of Gastroenterology in 2019 um, um, had a consensus care bundle about how we manage it. Yeah. So the BSG bundle includes six domains. It starts with recognition, resuscitation, risk assessment and stratification, therapy, referral for um, endoscopy, and then the care after endoscopy and review of the patient. The three main questions when we're managing an upper GI bleed are first, if it is indeed an upper GI bleed, um, second, if our patient is stable or unstable, and if this is a variceal or non variceal bleed, because they have different management. Starting from the recognition, uh, the cardinal um, signs and symptoms of upper GI bleed are hematemesis, melina, and coffee ground vomiting. However, there are some more atypical things like hematochasia, uh, which could happen. It's more, it happens more in lower GI bleeds. However, it could happen with large upper GI bleed, and then it would lead to hemodynamic instability and present with hypertension and tachycardia. We should always remember and exclude some mimics of upper GI bleed, such as hemoptysis or a lower GI bleed. Continuing with the recognition, some clues from the history that could point towards the cause of bleeding. So if you have a patient that has the stigmata of chronic liver disease, then we could think that he might have a seal bleed. Um, if there's a patient that had a protracted retching, proceeding with hemesis, then the cause could be a malar revised tear. If from the history there is weight loss, anorexia, dysphagia, or any abdominal mass, this could be a sign of malignancy. Patients that they're using regularly NSAIDs, they have heartburns, they're smokers, or they have been diagnosed previously with Helicobacter pylori, that could be, for example, a peptic ulcer. If we are on ITU, as we can see here from the table on the last um, row, um, in patients that they are in multi-organ failure and uh, they have high inotrope requirements, the most possible cause, and there's something else in the history, could be stress ulcers. From the physical examination, of course, like if we see like ascites or uh, we see jaundice, then we could consider that there is some sort of chronic liver disease going on. Um, if the patient presents with acute abdominal pain, then we could consider that there might be um, an abdomen, so perforation, there might be perforated duodenal ulcer. Um, some vascular causes of upper GI bleed, um, they, um, they could show us from the examination with a characteristic uh, skin lesions, as we can see on the right side, 
which happens in hereditary um, telangiectasis. Telang 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 um, continuing with the resuscitation, the main goals are to correct hypovolemia, to restore tissue perfusion and prevent multi organ failure. Again, when we're talking about resuscitation, it's always um, assess and resuscitate um, as per ABC. So um, high flow oxygen, technically two large bore cannula, we sent for bloods, including full blood count, using LFTs lactates, um, full clotting, including side drainogen, and we could consider also finding a cell. We would group and save and cross match for four to six units, or again, depending on the clinical circumstances. <coughs> In terms of blood transfusion and fluids that we're using, uh, we could use a bolus of crystalloids. If we use bloods, um, the transfusion target for patients that they have an active GI bleed, however, they're stable, is um, hemoglobin of seven, unless we have patients that have a history of coronary disease that um, their target is a little bit higher, it's about nine. In patients that they are having active GI bleed and they're exsanguinating, so they're unstable, um, they usually require blood transfusion right, right, very early on their presentation and they will require replacement of coagulation factors, either this is FFP um, or cryo um, and platelets. Uh, we should always activate the major hernia corticoid if they are like very, very unstable. And from our experience for trauma, um, we would resuscitate it with one RBC, one FFP, one platelet. Uh, this ratio has been shown that it achieves better hemostasis and that decreases mortality at least for the first 24 hours. In terms of vasopressors, well, of course, we are going to use vasopressors in case um, we see that uh, there is resistant hypertension after resuscitation. There aren't any randomized uh, trials that they can show that any vasopressor is better than the other. However, we know that in critical ill patients, if we use dopamine, then you have a higher risk of having arrhythmias. Uh, vasopressin, it could be used. However, we have to remember that when we use it, it actually constricts the vasodilatory circulation, so it can cause a gut ischemia. Now, the question about intubating or not, of course, if you know, like there is a clear contraindication, you would intubate. However, you should be prepared for a difficult airway, and you should make sure that you have anticipated and you can treat hypertension that will come with your intubation, you could consider using, you know, like a cardiostable in general, like anesthetic, continue use ketamine or midazolam, or depending on our experience. I mean, depends if you're an experienced operator, then you know, you know better what to use. It's not about the agent that you're using, but more about how you do it. There is definitely no evidence of prophylactic intubations prior to endoscopy. So there was actually a meta-analysis um, in 2019, and uh, they concluded that prophylactic intubation in severe upper GI bleed is associated with a greater risk of uh, pneumonias, lack of stay, and death. Continuing with the resuscitation, if we consider that uh, the cause of upper GI bleed is maybe viruses, then we should also add on antibiotics and termopressin. So sepsis and infection uh, is a usual cause uh, why these patients are coming with um, a very sealed bleed. And we should add on termopressin. So it is a synthetic vasopressin analogue that um, decreases uh, portal pressures and um, it, it, it helps. However, it has some contraindications, such as a previous stroke on ice. Uh, and in this situation, we could use somatostatin, which has been shown to be um, effective with the strain. We shouldn't forget to just run through also the medication history. We should stop any anticoagulants and we should definitely reverse, you know, like any coagulopathy at least, you know, like from, from medications like aspirin or dobitazam or everything else. This should happen um, after discussion with a hematologist, okay, and especially in the situation that we can have an antibiotic. 
At the same time that we're doing all this, we should consider a risk stratification, okay? So how is a patient, is it high risk, low risk, medium risk? What are we going to do? Are we going to stay in B? Are they going home? Are they staying in the hospital? Are they going to ICU? So there are a lot of stratification tools. Uh, here you can see the Glasgow Blood Sport Bleeding Score, which is one of the best actually that they are using this situation. So this score, uh, it can be done prior to an endoscopy and uh, it includes uh, some measures such as blood urea, hemoglobin, uh, some physiological parameters such as systolic blood pressure and uh, uh, the heart rate. Um, some, um, um, some information from the past medical history, such as hepatic disease or cardiac failure, and the presence of melina or previous syncope. So all these are added up, and then we have um, a score, a score of more than eight has been shown that it has um, a higher risk of ICU admission and mortality. Another score which is uh, used uh, to stratify patients in terms of mortality and re-bleeding is the Rockwell scoring system. So this comes, can be calculated uh, before endoscopy, however, that's not really the total Rockwell score. And then when we do the endoscopy, we get some information from there and we calculate the total um, Rockwell score, okay? So this score um, takes into account the age of the patient, the evidence of shock, uh, comorbidities, um, the diagnosis, so malignancy has actually a worse um, 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 diagnosis, it's a worse diagnosis, and then, as we said, the evidence of bleeding from endoscopy. Again, uh, a total score of more than eight has a higher mortality um, of about like 41 percent, just to, to put it a little bit in our mind how it is, and the chance of re-bleed is 41 percent as well, okay? In terms of uh, referral and uh, timing for the endoscopy, well, there are a lot of trials around that they are conflicting and they are mainly re retrospective. Uh, data suggests that there is a mortality benefit from doing the endoscopy in less than 24 hours in all the patients. Um, in patients that they are unstable or they have, you know, like, um, of the, or they are taking anticoagulants that they shouldn't stop for a long time, um, let's say, for example, cardiac patients here. Yeah? Uh, it should happen in less than 12 hours. Um, so specifically, the UK uh, British Gastroenterology Guidelines, they say that for uh, patients that they have like master hemorrhage, then they should be resuscitated for six to 12 hours, that they would benefit in order to stabilize them and correct any, any medical causes. Uh, of bleeding, and then go for endoscopy. Uh, of course, the resuscitation process is, 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 is very, very important. Uh, however, if we do all this, they're still bleeding, then we just need to just re-discuss it with uh, gastro. In terms of the uh, modalities of endoscopic treatment, this depends largely on the cause of the upper GI bleed. So, for example, the non variceal bleed, um, and in case of ulcers, ulcers can be like low risk of bleeding um, and high risk of bleeding. So, from what you can see, like on the right side, I have just some photos of the different um, classification of ulcers. There is the named porous classification. So, a porous classification of one and two A and B, they're high risk. Um, and ulcers, and they require dual modality therapy, uh, which includes injection of adrenaline or a thermal modality to stop the bleeding or treat, for example. If this doesn't work, a rescue therapy would be hemostatic powders, angioembolization with coils, and even surgery. For the rest, um, then uh, we, we don't really necessarily need to do something. So whenever you just see from the endoscopy report that, you know, like there is, for example, oozing from the ulcer base, that this is what they found, or there is a visible vessel or an adherent clot, then this is when they have some not really something. In terms of uh, the endoscopic management of variceal bleed, there are guidelines 
uh, from 2015, and these are the ones that they are followed in the UK. So it largely depends on where do we have the viruses. There are different types of viruses. Uh, for the ones that they are esophageal, so we have the band ligation. So with the band ligation, it's like yeah, a band that goes to the virus. It it's like it's obstructed, so there is a clot formed there. Okay, and this is it. It stops the bleeding. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the gastric variceal bleeding, then they can just use a hemostatic thing like um, glues and or even um, a thrombin. In case of refractory variceal bleed, there are other modalities. So TIPS is one of them. TIPS stands for transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunts and it is used for uh, portal hypertension. So in this situation, um, the radiologist or um, the endoscopist, they're working together and they're just actually, as you can see on the left side, um, there is uh, a stent place between the portal vein um, and um, the systemic veins and this releases pressure uh, from the liver. The clinical benefits are that it stops the bleed, uh, it reduces the ascites and the hydrothorax. So in case that we have refractory to medication um, ascites and hydrothorax, we could ask for tips. And it has been shown to improve liver and uh, renal function. The complications of tips, there are a lot. That's why we should not ask, maybe the gastro, there are like really strict uh, selection criteria for the patients. So complications can be early or late. Um, the early there are bleeding, infection, liver failure, heart failure, kidney failure, everything has to do with all the <coughs> procedure. Um, and late are hepatic megacalopathy, which is actually really, really um, uh, common and it happens to, uh, in one third of the patients. Uh, it could respond positively to simple measures and medical therapy, uh, but it might be you know, like necessary to just go back actually and uh, block off the tips. Since we have all this complication, um, we can understand why there is a strict selection of patients. So if, for example, uh, we have patients that are like more than 65 years old, they have severe renal disease, they score high on the child poo score or they have like severe encephalopathy uh, beforehand, they have some sort of vascular anatomy, you know, like <coughs> deformity, or they have um, severe pulmonary hypertension or they are sarcopenic, all this are actually things that would make us move away uh, from the tips, okay? Another modality used in failed OGDs is uh, the balloon tamponade, uh, tamponade. So imagine that there is some sort of tube, set some sort of balloon, okay, just applying pressure. Um, so there are different types of, uh, um, uh, of tubes. Um, the prototype is the St. Sagan Blackmore tube, which has three lumens. However, there are others that they have, like the Minnesota that has four lumens, and the Linton Nacklet that has one lumen. And it's like a, a urinary catheter, really, if you think about it. So the St. Sagan Blackmore tube has uh, a gastric balloon, an esophageal balloon, and a single uh, aspiration uh, port. Um, the indications are life-threatening after GI bleed, which is very seal uh, in origin, and uh, contraindications are yeah, esophageal strictures or recent <laughs> esophageal or gastric surgery, which is the, the risk of perforation. In terms of the insertion, personally, I've never placed it. I have never seen it being placed on ICU, although in the books you would that it is done. I have always seen it, you know, like in theatres, placed by the endoscopy, which are there actually direct you know, like guidance. Um, so uh, yes, um, after they they after the tube is in, then there is some traction you know like applied uh, so that there is pressure and um, the position of the tube should be checked with an x-ray. 
hopefully it's going to be like the x-ray that you have on the left side and the balloon is in the stomach and not you know like an esophagus as we can see on the right side otherwise there's a high risk of uh, perforation in terms of the complications um they're major minor so yeah minor they're like dry mouth mucous ulceration sore throat sepsis and major as aspiration, pneumonia, um, gastric ulcers, um, just because there is uh, pressure, there might be ischemia or uh, necrosis from the balloon. So there can be esophageal perforation or even, you know, like uh, leaky tube uh, displacement. Okay, these are these patients to be on the belt as well. Okay, yeah. I forgot to mention that the tube can be inserted either from the mouth, which is the preferred. You know, like mouth, and um, this is in patients that are asleep or through uh, the nose. Um, in terms of the six um, pillar, let's say of the bundle. Uh, so after, I think that, that okay. Sorry, I missed I missed one slide. Right. So in terms of the removal um, of the tubes, this should happen just prior to definite endoscopic treatment. Okay, because there is a risk that they just bleed exactly again. Um, usually, it, it could stay in for up to 72 hours if you know, like the endoscopist haven't achieved actually some sort of hemostasis. Then um, the gastroenterologists are going to place the NG uh, with the endoscopy, and from our point of view, we should monitor for, for ongoing uh, GI bleed. And signs of ischemia and the crosses of perforation, which uh, would have like non specific signs or like really sounds like on the nephagia or you know, like having x rays that they look like this one with um, uh, pneumothorax and surgical emphysema. Okay, in terms of post endoscopy, uh, what do we do afterwards? We have to, after the patient has the endoscopy, we just have to review uh, the report. Uh, we care about the findings, um, the presence of hemorrhagic stigmata, uh, therapy, what they really <coughs> did, what is the sensitivity of hemostasis, if they had any complications, and um, further management, review of anticoagulation, and plan in case of a re-bleed. In terms of uh, non-variceal bleed, we should start PPI either uh, an infusion or boluses for 72 hours there's really like no difference and then we should also make a plan of how to start an anticoagulation in those patients so aspirin uh, should could be started uh, in the next like three days if patients are in dual replacement therapy uh, this is difficult it's a difficult decision so we will need to speak with cardiology having a discussion with the patient, inform them about the risk. For everything else, they could start in the next 7 to 15 um, uh, days. If the bleed is very seal, as we said, we have to make sure that we're going to continue with the antibiotics, uh, with uh, therapy pressing, and probably when the patient is stable enough, we should start a non-selective beta blocker, the ones that they're used currently are uh, pervedilol and in the past it was propramolol. And of course, if we're on ICU, uh, we should continue with organ um, support. Um, treat ourselves by uh, drainage, uh, given heart, treat sepsis, um, protect and manage renal function and um, manage nutrition. Uh, more or less, this was the presentation. There is nothing like really more to talk about. The take-home message is that upper GI bleed has a high mortality. We need to distinguish early between variceal and non-variceal bleed because they have a different uh, management. Um, it requires multidisciplinary collaboration, proper recognition and resuscitation, careful use of blood products. Okay, so. Yes, we will use blood products, but on the other hand, we don't want to overdo it uh, because it will increase also the portal pressure. So, okay, so the bleeding might actually become worse. Correct any coagulopathy and have early endoscopy or radiological intervention. This is
Is it? Um, and factions. Okay. Anything? No? I always found the text criteria really confusing. They're about they, they seem to vary mm. specific. No, this, this is true, but I think that the, um, the, elect, the criteria for elective kids are a little bit different, so these were the elective ones. Yeah. The criteria for an emergency kit, which I think that probably this is what we would have there a little bit different, and they're saying that actually, if you're thinking that the patient might really die, then maybe you should, yeah. to be honest, try it. That's, that's, that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. So you know how to manage now, not to be with them saying like this, that's the word, okay? Okay, yeah. okay. okay, fair enough. Good. Thank I, you very much. I would say if you're in a thing, um, that I always forget about, but it's useful is if they're on the unit and they're ventilated, with, and when they go for their endoscopy or they do the endoscopy on the unit, um, try and get the gastroenterology specific and then keep that at the same time because otherwise you get to a couple of days later and go, oh, damn it, don't ever put one down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I have a habit of forgetting. Just give us a second to. Yeah, yeah. Questions and comments, really. Um, I think the other thing um, that works quite well at the Royal is getting the endoscopy team to do the scope on on the ITU, particularly if the patient's already intubated. Um, that can work quite well. Um, and um, just a comment. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and just a comment. Um, so. Um, nice study published published in Nature. Um, I uh, I know that I've said before that um, COVID does increase the risk of GI bleeding. Um, so it increases the risk of bleeding for a variety of reasons, up to two years out from infection, both in hospitalised and non-hospitalised patients. Um, and also, we know that patients that have COVID are at increased risk of bleeding because of some of the therapies we gave them too. So, we did uh, that did complicate sort of some of the patients that we had over the last couple of years. But yeah, quite a nice study in Nature. Increases gastritis, um, reflux, peptic ulcer disease, and coagulopathy for up to 720 days in non-hospitalised patients, which is quite interesting. Hello, uh, my name is Alvin. Uh, I'm one of the anaesthetic SD4s, uh, and I am here to talk to you today about quite a bit of a niche topic, actually, um, and that is uh, use of rifaximin for hepatic encephalopathy in the intensive care unit setting for acute hepatic encephalopathy. Um, I've got a paper to present, a couple of bits and pieces about guidelines, and then we'll, we'll sort of do a whistle top, stop tour uh, about uh, rifaximin and product characteristics of it. Medication. <clears throat> so that's our objectives for today. We'll start off with um, sort of characteristics of rifaximin. Um, so rifaximin is based is a rifamycin-based non-systemic antibiotic. Uh, the mechanism of action it inhibits DNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase and therefore is a bacteriostatic antibiotic. It is an antibiotic with really quite a broad spectrum of action. Um, gram positives, negatives, uh, <clears throat> anaerobes, as well as aerobes. Its pharmacokinetics itself is actually very similar to bank oral vancomycin in that the oral absorption is almost zero, so it's 0.4% oral bioavailability. Its distribution, we really don't have much data on it because of how little is absorbed. Uh, it is metabolized hepatically, but uh, uh, probably of little significance given. Uh, the, the little oral absorption. Uh, it is eliminated 96% via the stool, so it's pretty much a very localised effect in the gut. Uh, for hepatic encephalopathy, the mode of action uh, is that it changes the gut microbiota, uh, reducing sort of ammonia producing microorganisms, thereby reducing serum levels of ammonia by that mechanism. <clears throat> 
Um, so this is the paper that I'll be talking about today. It is uh, hot off the press, actually, published this year um, in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, and it looks at antibiotics with or without rifaximin uh, for patients that are admitted to the intensive care unit uh, for hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, it's an RCT. Uh, it's not a very large RCT. There actually aren't many RCTs of a, of a large size uh, addressing this particular issue. Um, so this is one of the few. <clears throat> uh, so the study details, it's a single center study. It's double-blinded RCT. It was carried out in the Asian Institute of uh, Gastroenterology in uh, sort of central India. Um, so in terms of sort of a patient demographic point of view, it's very much Indian um, only. <clears throat> uh, so in terms of the research question for this uh, paper, uh, it looked at ICU patients. Uh, only, and it's ICU patients that present with overt hepatic encephalopathy secondary to chronic liver disease, so cirrhotic patients essentially. Uh, overt hepatic encephalopathy being defined as uh, grade 2 encephalopathy plus uh, on the West Haven uh, criteria. Um, and the intervention was the addition of rifaximin on top of broad spectrum antibiotics, which was the standard sort of ma management in this particular hospital was that everybody presenting with hepatic encephalopathy got broad spectrum antibiotics. And uh, the question being whether that improved uh, the speed of resolution or the resolution of hepatic encephalopathy, um, whether rifaximin helped at all. Um, in terms of the intervention itself, um, it was the addition of the rifaximin dose at 550 milligrams BD, fairly standard dosing on top of the standard care. Uh, the standard care in this particular hospital, some, some points are a little bit interesting. Um, of course, basic things, treating the, the actual cause of hepatic encephalopathy in the first place, so whether that be a GI bleed, uh, electrolyte dysfunction, or dehydration, constipation, so that's addressing the primary problem. Um, but also, in, in this particular institute, um, broad-spectrum antibiotics uh, was standard for anyone admitted to intensive care uh, with hepatic encephalopathy. Um, Lactulose, either via an enteral or an enema route, aiming for two to three stools. This is all looking fairly familiar to us. Um, but a slight interesting sort of twist is that if you had a baseline AKI, so if any of these patients have AKI, they would actually almost treat these guys as a sort of HRS type 1. So they'd turn press in them, and then they also uh, give volume resuscitation via albumin expansion. Uh, if you didn't have a renal injury, they'd use uh, something called uh, L-ornithine, Aspartate, uh, Lola, which is pretty much uh, a third line agent uh, for hepatic encephalopathy. I certainly haven't seen it in, in the UK or in the IQ that I've used. Um, and in terms of sort of assessment of hepatic encephalopathy, they, the team in this study tried to standardize it. Um, they made the assessment only in between 9 and 10 a.m. Uh, they had two authors being the only people doing the assessments for hepatic encephalopathy. And if they didn't get agreement between the two authors, they'd have a third person mediate. Uh, of course, if you were uh, if ventilated for your for your HE, uh, then you'd receive a sedation hold in order to, to get your assessment um, of your neurological status. Methodology-wise, um, so this study was allegedly powered at 90%, but actually um, the paper didn't include a lot of detail about uh, what they're trying to detect, what exact difference they're trying to detect. But sort of taking their, their word for it, um, they did a power calculation and said they need, needed 88 patients in each arm to detect a significant difference. Um, and uh, they added a couple of extra patients for a 5% sort of attrition rate of potentially losing patients along the study. Uh, the primary outcome in this study was a, a two-grade improvement in hepatic encephalopathy or complete resolution. Um, secondary outcomes, hospital mortality, length of hospital stay, nosocomial infections, and endotoxin levels, which is sort of not something we look a lot at uh, clinically. <clears throat> so in terms of allocation of treatment arms, um, we had, well, they had 260 that potentially could have been recruited to the trial. Um, 24, they needed to have been within 24 hours of ITU admission. Uh, and they applied an exclusion criteria, which excluded about 76 out of the 260. Uh, and subsequently, there was randomization um, via a computer, as well as some sealed envelopes in order to double-blind the trial. 
uh, and the randomization was a one-to-one -one basis. Either you got standard uh, broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy, uh, or you got the standard antibiotics plus the rifaximin, <clears throat> uh, 92 in each, each arm, and the intervention would be continued for 14 days uh, or until death or discharge of the patient, whichever came sooner. Um, looking at this, just a quick thing about the exclusion criteria. Um, so looking at the exclusion criteria that they employed for this trial, I thought it was fairly reasonable. Um, acute liver failure was an exclusion criteria. They're specifically looking at chronic liver disease, acute liver failure, of course, being a very distinct entity in itself. Uh, grade 1 encephalopathy, they excluded intensivists not interested in sort of mild encephalopathy. Uh, and other sort of confounding factors like neuropsychiatric uh, diagnoses or intracranial bleeds, or if you've had alcohol recently and potential for uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy. Um, so, so, and urea over 53, which uh, potential for uh, uremic encephalopathy. Um, so I think the exclusion criteria was fairly reasonable. Uh, in terms of the methodology and analysis, the data was uh, analyzed on an intention to treat analysis, uh, various uh, sort of students' t-tests, uh, chi-squared or Fisher's exact test. Uh, and then they also used the Kaplan-Meier survival curves to uh, look at the resonance to assess the resolution of hepatic encephalopathy and for in-hospital mortality. Um, in terms of the results, um, the two treatment arms actually had fairly good and well-matched baseline characteristics of the patients, uh, especially with sex and age, average patient age, about 48 in each arm. Um, etiology of liver, liver disease was also well-matched in both groups, mainly or predictably alcohol and NASH were sort of the mainly features uh, etiologies of cirrhosis, small contribution from viral and others, but certainly not the major contribution. Um, AKI, sort of baseline AKI rate was about 50 or 60% between the two groups. Um, again, that's important because that determined whether they got the third line uh, uh, therapy, uh, which could confound the results. <clears throat> Approximately 30% of each group were, were mechanically ventilated for hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, I've got to say, in sort of our experience, by the time they come to ITU, we're we're closer to maybe 80 or 90 percent ventilated so that certainly their patient group is slightly different from what we might see on a typical uk intensive care uh, looking at all scores and, and sofa scores they were well matched in the between the two arms so so roughly they had the same level of illness between the two, two arms um, and they also looked at subclassifications of, of decompensated uh, cirrhosis compared to a true aclf um, for those of you that are unfamiliar uh, a simple decompensated uh, uh, a liver uh, is sort of hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, maybe GI bleed, but organ failure doesn't really feature heavily, whereas ACLF is, is a far more sort of malignant condition, uh, with, which is characterized by uh, early mortality as well as uh, multiple organ failure. So they, they had sort of, they, they looked into sort of subgroups there as well. Right. This trial, uh, looking at the primary outcomes uh, of, just to remind you, grade two encephalopathy improvement, two grades of encephalopathy improvement, or complete resolution. Um, essentially, the rifaximin didn't do anything. Uh, if you look at the, the sort of percentage, about 40% of resolution either way. Um, and uh, I suppose the authors weren't quite happy with that result, so they did sort of subgroup analysis based on patients that either had a proven infection or without a proven infection. And uh, sort of predictably, those that without a proven infection uh, sort of have a higher rate of resolution of their encephalopathy. But actually, the rifaximin really didn't do a lot. Um, secondary outcomes, uh, to, to really summarize it, in hospital mortality, there might be a little bit of a light signal there. Uh, P-value is just shy of 0 0.5. But actually, the confidence intervals really uh, overlap each other quite significantly. Um, and uh, the trial, of course, wasn't powered to look at the, sec the, the secondary outcomes uh, and therefore take this with a grain of salt. Um, length of hospital stay as well as nosocomial infections were significantly different at all. I'm surprised they actually got this published because it's essentially a negative trial. <laughs> uh, but negative trials are useful as well. Um, so my thoughts and sort of criticisms about this trial, methodologically, I, I thought they made a reasonable attempt at uh, 
uh, correcting for bias, um, making sure that blinding was done properly. Um, uh, they did do a power calculation, although they didn't explain very well um, how they did that. They didn't certainly didn't include the calculation in the paper. Um, liver patients are very um, the underlying trigger of their hepatic encephalopathy, as well as um, the, the actual underlying cause of the chronic liver disease may well change the likelihood of you recovering from the hepatic encephalopathy. So I think that's probably a major confounding factor. Um, there's also significant heterogeneity in what the authors use or what they call broad spectrum antibiotics. So it didn't seem like in this hospital they had a, sort of a defined specific antibiotic that they would use for these cases. Um, broad spectrum could be defined, according to the authors, as uh, a penicillin with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, it could be a meropenem, it could be uh, a cephalosporin. So, you know, of course, they each have a different spectrum of action, and that in itself will confound the results uh, from this trial. Again, it's a single center study, uh, Indian ethnicity, so it may not be applicable to the UK. Uh, interestingly, 90% of the patients were guys. Um, so maybe it says something about drinking culture there, but amongst the guys. Uh, so limited applicability for the female population. Uh, relatively small sample size, uh, you know, the secondary outcomes, again, not powered um, to, to sort of detect the significant difference. And so actually, uh, very little can be drawn from this study, I think. Um, in terms of actual sort of UK guidance, how does this link to UK practice? Well, the, there's only a single piece of guidance from NICE that looks at rifaximin and hepatic encephalopathy. And the evidence that it addresses, it's almost all to do with prevention and, or secondary prevention of hepatic encephalopathy in patients that have failed initial management. Um, so patients that come in and out because of repeated episode of uh, hepatic encephalopathy and not really in the acute ICU setting where the patient has had an acute decompensation. NICE guidelines definitely do not cover that area of practice at all. Um, now, looking at sort of the national practice, uh, from what I get, can get from the interwebs, um, I've looked at various guidelines from different trusts, and actually there is a very significant uh, variation uh, in practice amongst even in the UK. So on one side of things in, in Leeds teaching hospitals, um, their stance on it is on the, in the ICU setting uh, in the, for acute, acute hepatic encephalopathy, there is no role for, for rifaximin, full stop. So that's their stance on it. Whereas if you went to St. George's, um, their stance is that it's probably sort of third line treatment and they would insist on uh, an EEG to demonstrate encephalopathy uh, and then a hepatologist to come and agree to that uh, before prescription uh, of rifaximin. Whereas if you're sort of down the road, Derby, uh, a bit more of a sort of practical, <laughs> or a little bit easier, um, if first line, second, line treatment is not working, uh, then you could prescribe with, uh, without uh, hepatologist involvement. Uh, so certainly, even amongst gastroenterologists, uh, there's a big variation in UK practice, um, and I probably would want to speak to a gastroenterologist to, to see what their take on it locally is. Um, in conclusion, um, having read, uh, done a bit more reading about this, I am no more convinced than I was uh, before doing all the reading. Uh, about the efficacy of rifaximin in acute sort of decompensation. I do see it prescribed every now and again, maybe as a bottom of the barrel sort of scraping sort of drug, but certainly if you're already on broad spectrum antibiotics, then, you know, you, you should have the sort of the same level of cover as rifaximin anyway, so I'm not sure you're going to get a lot of extra benefit from that. So that is me. Yeah. I'm actually sure I've got just speaking to local pathologists because the evidence is very poor in the acute setting. You seem to have um, promoted that. I mean, it's used in cirrhotics who had episodes of decompensation, have a, a prophylaxis of decompensation, but they take it at home almost. Is that? Yes, that's, yeah. that's exactly what it is. They take it while they're well, and there's some evidence it reduces relapse or incidence of relapse. That was my take on it, having spoken to Toby and others. Um, Although you're right, we have used it here acutely uh, with, with blessing from gastro. So, so not obviously, not consistently, that would be used. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is consistent. Do we have a policy? 
wieder neu in die HR Interesting. And actually, if you go on Nerve Center and try to prescribe a vaccine, uh, the default length of treatment is 999 days. <laughs> so it's actually for much more for chronic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Probably I'm very surprised that, you know, a negative trial. Why, why do you want to give uh, prospectin antibiotics ranging from penicillin to medicine? And do you think you could just have to have it on As in, the Lola is not on the top back range. Lola is a combination of two amino acids. I think it's a lot on between elastase, yeah. which tends to decrease the amount of production in the body. Again, the evidence for it is very, very, very sketchy. Probably sketchier than than the vaccine. I believe, yeah. I mean, Jefferson will use it on and off based on who the consultant is on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my experience, in London, yes, yeah, they do use it on and off, especially in sort of post transplant patients who are stuck and they don't know what to do. Yeah. They don't stick up an infusion of Lola. But again, there's no real evidence that it works. But if you're giving it to everyone, and then you're also giving antibiotics and methoxylene, <laughs> not sure how you can interpret that. No, it's not really. 